الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to another episode of Know Your Prophet Looking at some of the ahadith from the amazing book of Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi rahimahullahu ta'ala Shama'il nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and as we said, this book, Shama'ilun Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deals with the comprehensive description and characteristics of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How he used to look, how he used to behave, his personal possessions, his way of life, what he used to eat and how he used to eat, how he used to speak and his worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he was known for sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so we continue with the ninth or tenth chapter according to the difference in the manuscripts of the book. Babu ma jaa fi khuffi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That which is narrated about the leather socks of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first hadith that Imam Al-Tirmidhi mentions, rahimahullah ta'ala, is the hadith of Buraidah, radiyallahu ta'ala an, that An-Najashi, rahimahullah ta'ala, wa radiya an, gave a gift to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of two leather socks, but there is a description of them that they were black and they were smooth or they were plain. Two black, plain leather socks. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put them on, then he made wudu and he wiped over them. And the second hadith that Imam Al-Tirmidhi Rahimahullah Ta'ala mentions in this topic is the Hadith of Al Mughira ibn Shu'bah radiallahu an that Dihya radiallahu ta'ala an gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam two khuf, two leather socks, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put them on. So we begin by talking about the leather socks of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First of all, in the first hadith, it is mentioned that An Najashi. An Najashi gave the socks to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And An Najashi is not a name. The name of An Najashi is Ashama. And An Najashi is a term or a, a given name or title that is given to every ruler of Al Habasha. And Al Habasha is the area which was traditionally known as Abyssinia. And it comprises of some different countries today Ethiopia or Eritrea, that sort of area. And it was known as Al Habasha, Abyssinia. And Every ruler of Abyssinia would be known as a Najashi. This was a title. Like Caesar was given as a title to every ruler of Rome. Every Roman emperor was called Caesar. Every Abyssinian emperor was called a Najashi. But this a Najashi had believed in the Prophet wasallam and had accepted Islam. And he didn't see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his life, but he believed in him without having met him. So he was not from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the condition of being a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that they must see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was alive, believing in him, and die upon Islam. 
As for those who lived during the life of the Prophet wasallam, but they didn't see him and they met some of the companions, they are known as, or by the term, one of them is known as Tabi'iyun Mukhadram. A Tabi'i, a follower of the Sahaba, but they lived during the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And there were more than one of the Tabi'een who were not from the time-wise, from the generation after the companions. They were from the generation of the companions and of the age of the companions. And perhaps some of them were older than the companions in the vast majority. But they did not meet the Prophet wasallam, and instead they met some of the Sahaba and accepted Islam. And al Najashi, rahimahullah ta'ala, accepted Islam. And the Prophet wasallam prayed his janazah, salat al al ghaib, a funeral prayer over the person who is not present. And that was because when he died, there was said to be no Muslim who would pray over him. As in he was not able to fulfill the conditions of the janazah when he had passed away, the conditions of the janazah were not able to be fulfilled for him. And the Prophet wasallam prayed his janazah prayer in his absence. Salawatullahi wasalamuhu alayhi. And as for the word black, then this is the color of the leather socks. And a khuf is something that you wear as a sock and it covers the whole foot above the ankle. A khuf is something you wear as a sock and it covers the whole foot above the ankle. So from the ankle or from above the ankle and it covers the whole foot, you place your foot into it. And it is only called a khuf when it's made from leather. As for when it's made from wool or cotton, it's called a jawrab. And that's why the ulama of fiqh, when they come to the issue of wiping over the socks, they talk about the difference between the khuf and the jawrab, between the leather sock and the woolen sock. And we said that the correct opinion is that you can wipe over both as long as the woolen or cotton sock is not very, very thin. You can wipe over both. And the Sahaba wiped over their khuf, their leather socks, and they wiped over their jawarib, their cotton or woolen socks. But as for the Prophet wasallam, I have not found a narration that the Prophet wasallam would wear woolen socks. Some of this is narrated from his companions radiallahu anhum. As for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it is narrated that he would occasionally wear leather socks. And these are called khuf or khifaf. And mostly when they are mentioned in the sunnah, they're mentioned in the dual form, khuffain or khuffan, two of them. And it's mentioned in this hadith that the khuf that was given to the Prophet wasallam, the two leather socks were black. And they were plain. And the meaning of plain is that the leather was tanned. When you have leather, the leather naturally has hair on it. It has the fur or the hair of the animal on it. Whether that is any of the animals of Bahimatul An'am, of the cattle, such as the sheep or the cow, and so on and so forth. And so it would have the hair of the animal or the fur of the animal on it. After it is tanned, it becomes completely plain. And so it has nothing on it at all. And it's completely smooth and plain. And also the meaning of plain in this hadith is that they had no decoration on them. So they were plain and they had no decoration on them. And from the things that is beneficial to mention in this regard is that the Prophet ﷺ put them on immediately when he received them as a gift. 
and this is from the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and from that which puts happiness into the heart of the person giving the gift that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not say Jazakallahu khaira and put them to the side rather the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam straight away put them on straight away he put them on to show his thankfulness and his gratitude to the person who gave it and to make them feel happy that I gave him a gift and I saw him put them on straight away and then he made wudu and he wiped over them and this is reported by Tawatur it's reported by so many people from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wasallam would wipe over his khuf just as the Sahaba would wipe over their leather socks or their cotton or woolen socks when they were making wudu and the description of this we will cover insha'Allah ta'ala after the break and talk a little bit about that so that people understand what it means that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wiped over them until then assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We were talking about the khuf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the leather socks of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that he was given two plain black leather socks by an Najashi rahimahullahu ta'ala, and an Najashi gave them to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he put them on and then he would make wudu and he would wipe over them and just so that we can be clear about what this means what this means is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would make a full wudu for the prayer including washing his feet and it is a requirement to wash the feet and not to wipe over the feet the bare feet so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would wash his feet and then before breaking his wudu, whether immediately or whether after some time, but before breaking his wudu, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would put on the khuf, the leather socks. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would put them on after having made wudu and before breaking the wudu, whether he did it immediately or whether he did it after some time. So it may be that he did it as soon as he had made wudu or that he would put them on after an hour or after two hours the main thing is that he would put them on without having broken his wudu after that for a period of 24 hours a day and a night if he was in his hometown of Medina he sallallahu alayhi wasallam would wipe over them and the way that he would wipe over them is that he would wet his hands and he would wipe once from the toe over the top of the foot from the toe over the top of the foot the toe over to the top of the foot and he would not wipe over the bottom of the foot once on the right foot and once on the left salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi as for when he was traveling sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then the period was extended to three times, i.e. 72 hours, three days and three nights that he would wipe over without taking them off and making fresh wudu. And also from the points that the ulama of Islam mentioned with regard to this is if you were to take off the khuf, it would not break your wudu but you must then wash your feet at the next wudu that you make so let's say you have made wudu by wiping over the socks and you take them off you still have your wudu but as soon as it comes to the point that you need to make wudu again you can't simply put them on and wipe over them because you've taken them off and you have to put them on with a proper full wudu so taking it off doesn't break your wudu but putting them on you have to put them on with a full wudu 
And there is a, a weakness in the chain that Al-Imam At-Tirmidhi mentions in this hadith. However, it has supporting narrations that bring it up to the level of being an acceptable proof, insha'Allah ta'ala. And as for the hadith of Al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah, then it talks about Dihya, and Dihya is Al-Kalbi radiallahu an. And Dihya Al-Kalbi radiallahu an was from the most handsome of the Sahaba. And it's narrated that Jibreel, when he would take human form, would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the form of Dihya Al-Kalbi radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. And now we come to the next chapter that is mentioned by Al-Imam Al-Tirmidhi rahimahullahu ta'ala. Babu ma jaa fi na'li rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter of that which relates to the shoe or the shoes, the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the first hadith is the hadith of Qatada rahimahullah ta'ala narrating from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an that Qatada asked Anas how were the sandals of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Anas said they had two qibal and a qibal are the piece of the sandal that goes in between the toes the toe hold and when you see the sandals that people wear today, some of the sandals have toe holds. And we're not talking about a circular space to insert the toe because this is not reported about the sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're not talking about the circular space that you would insert the toe, but a piece of the material, a piece of the strap, that goes downwards vertically that you would insert in between the toes in order to give you a good grip and to stop you from falling and so Anas describes the sandals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as having two toe hold two straps inserted between the toes and we said the straps that you insert between the toes are called in Arabic qibal. And that is the, the strap that goes downwards on the sandal and it fits in between the toes. And as for the issue of the sandals, again we come back to this key principle that when it comes to the matter of sandals, that it is not a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we are commanded to copy. And that's why in some of the authentic narrations it's mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr and Umar had the same type of sandal, the sandal that had two toe holds. And then when it came to the time of Uthman Radiallahu An, he had a sandal with one toe hold. And that's because this issue of sandals is like all of the issues of clothing that we've covered so far. And the issue of socks. There's nothing wrong with you wearing a khuf, leather socks. And there's nothing wrong with you wearing a jawrab, cotton or woolen socks. And there's nothing wrong with you having bare feet. None of these things are from the things that it is obligatory for you to copy from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rather, it is from the clothing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's people used to wear. And you know that sandals vary in styles. If you go to a sandal store, some of the sandals are different from others. Some of them are thick, some of them are thin, some of them have toe holes, some of them have straps. Some of them the straps go across, some of them the straps go vertically. All of these things are permissible in Islam. And it's not that if you see a person whose sandal has two toe holds, you say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, you have followed the Sunnah. Because if this was the case, then Uthman and Ali and all of the companions, radiallahu anhum, who came after them would have stuck to the exact type of sandal the Prophet wore. But they didn't. 
because they understood that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore the clothes of his people. And from the best indications of this is that the clothing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not differ from the clothing of the people of his time in any way. Neither in Mecca nor in Medina. Except in those things that are specifically mentioned in the Sharia like not going below the ankles and other points and the colors, the forbidding of the red color that is exclusively red for men and so on and so forth. These things that are explicitly mentioned in the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this changed. But the general clothing of the Prophet Sallallahu was the clothing of the Arabs and the clothing of the people of Mecca and the clothing of the people of Medina. And when he became a prophet and was given the glad tidings of prophethood, he didn't change his clothing and suddenly start wearing Muslim clothes. This is something the ulama of Islam, like Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, and others who have this attention to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu and the shama'il, the characteristics of the Prophet sallallahu mention that the Prophet sallallahu didn't change and wear Muslim clothes. He simply wore the clothes of the people of his time. Except in those things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to specifically prohibit, which he did. And the clothing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was varied. And this is another important point so that we understand this properly because we don't want people to watch this series and then to say, throw away my trainers and throw away my boots and throw away everything. I'm only going to wear a sandal that has two toe holes. And this is not from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the funny thing is that you see people saying this who don't pray. You see a brother wearing a turban and he doesn't pray Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. He says, I wear this turban out of the love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We say to him, no, this turban doesn't benefit you anything. This is the clothing the Prophet ﷺ used to wear, and you can wear it. But as for abandoning his sunnah for the sake of the custom of the Arabs, that all of the Arabs, the Mushrikun and the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims, all of them used to wear at the time, this is not what we are commanded to do. So we must understand this in the right context. That's all we have time for. Inshallah, in the next episode, we're going to talk more about this chapter of Imam Al-Tirmidhi about the sandal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh.